There is a difference, isn't there? Observe it closely. However strong my wish to be a magician, throwing fireballs all around, I'm merely a scientist asking, what's this difference? Where does it come from? As we shall see, lighters use a special kind of resilient materials called piezoelectrics. Fortunately, they are on my fingers, but despite this, they are still hugely useful materials. From medical imaging, lighters, to electronic devices, piezoelectrics have always taught us how to approach science resiliently. Because they are so simple, yet potent piece of knowledge, we ask why? Why are they rare? More precisely, why only some of them have a noticeable effect? Ladies and gentlemen, there is nothing greater, really, in all this science than being wisely flexible. Cambridge Dictionary defines resilience as the quality of being able to return quickly to a previous good condition after problems. But does it explain enough what we mean by this word? It's trash. I wouldn't be able to think about a more vague description for a physicist. Well, all the fancy names of state variables. Mathematical precision. <sighs> okay, though we don't need to state them bluntly today, we do have to consider resilience in the scientific regime. So first of all, if I did a street interview with 20 random physicists, all of them would reply, even regardless of the context, that a good condition is a condition with minimal energy. Humorously, less energy, less burden. By the second law of thermodynamics, we know that being in the state of minimal energy helps us to keep a quantity called entropy of the system unchanged. Let the increase of entropy tell us how far from equilibrium the system is, and it becomes immediately clear why entropy plays such a huge role in telling what's resilient. After all, resilience is just going back to the equilibrium. For instance, the rock of Sisyphus always rolled down because he was stubborn in adding surplus energy to it. This increased its entropy. And really, the rock had no choice. It was stubborn in finding rock and roll. Second of all, let us address problems. This pessimistic notion cannot be defended because it's Stretching, problematic to a spring? Obviously, it can break, but it is an object. It surely doesn't care about that anyway. Thanks to Sisyphus, that does not invoke problems. Rather, a process of changing the good condition we worked out, the absorption of energy. In total, resilience is the ability of an elastic material, such as rubber or animal tissue, to absorb energy, and release that energy as it springs back to its original shape. That's the reason we call a spring a resilient material. But good luck though to those who try to start a fire with a regular spring like this. Piezoelectrics have something more which makes them special. Upon stretching or compression, they can generate electricity in their bulk. If we go back to the lighter, now we see that the spark interacts with the extruded gas, giving fire. Think big. Imagine how many applications, how many new technologies it gives rise to. Don't spoil it. Don't spoil it. Let me make my guess about what you have thought about. Hmm. Electricity harvesting shoes. I knew it. Your personal power plant in your shoe sole. Walk, jump, charge. You could charge your mobile while walking, couldn't you? Well, you couldn't. That said, it is important to realize how big this effect can be. A project awarded by the International Council on System Engineering showed that one would have to make over 2 billion steps to singly charge an average mobile, and then subsequently watch Netflix for just a few hours.
paradoxical. We all know that binge-watching series of Netflix and working out are not meant to be done together. In other words, a single step in such shoots would generate only a few microcolumns of charge. In other, other words, assuming an average step is 78 cm long, that would correspond to covering the distance between the Earth and the Moon seven times. This prompts a question of how this effect can actually be useful. But don't you ever forget the future of energy harvesting applications is plentiful. For instance, piezoelectric airport runways, smart flooring or smart batteries. Ladies and gentlemen, this is up to you to construct them. But you'll need some hints in the beginning, won't you? Piezoelectrics are often used in the detection of sound and light signals. As absurd and vicious as this innovation may sound to some, Dob invented an extreme accuracy task ordnance bullet that can change course in mid-flight. This is a system with movable tail fins controlled by a piezoelectric. It steers the bullet towards the target illuminated by laser. Next, on this variety show are the contact microphones for percussion instruments. They use piezoelectrics to convert sound vibrations into electrical output. But wait, that's how sonars work, don't they? At least partially, that's only half of the story. The signal must have been sent out first. Hmm. What do we miss? What do we miss? Perhaps inverting our thinking will help us to crack it further. Is piezoelectricity reversible? Instead of generating electricity by stressing it, could we plug it to a voltage and make it dance? Let's dance. The answer is yes. Why? Let me tell you a story about a group of friend ions in quartz structure, shaping each other to dance. So, there was a circle of charged friends. Those who touch each other know each other. But as you may see, there are two of them who are quite alone. They could easily dance together. Like in the theme game, some external observer wants to bestow happiness on everyone. He applies the pressure of the environment, the one we all know from our own love affairs. This makes the ions move. The ions who are getting acquainted have to leave their comfort zone. This changes the distribution of the charge. The positive charge appears at the top, whereas the negative one accumulates at the bottom. The observer thinks he has done his job, thus he removes the stress. But as opposed to the computer game, ions have a certain kind of free will. Apparently, the previous distribution gave more space to all partygoers. Without hesitation, they return to it. The bottom dancer is like, I finally managed to get rid of this nasty additional electrical charge I've been carrying. I'm ecstatic. But the flirting was enjoyable, wasn't it? To continue, the urgent question of this molecular world is, would the observation we made differ if the lonely dancers initiated the dance themselves? I mean situation where Overcoming entropy and electrostatic interaction, they moved spontaneously as in the described example, but this time without any external observer. No, no one would dare to move elsewhere. This example shows that piezoelectricity is completely reversible because the charge distribution would change in the same way. As always, when gossiping, I haven't been telling you the whole story. In truth, if there is a center of inversion in the molecule, there can't be any electrical dipole. Only if the molecule lacks this kind of symmetry, the dipole can be created and modified by the applied pressure. We'll see this later. In general, Subtle, yet so tangible is the presence of this dancing mechanism around us. For example, toothbrushes. They have some linear piezoelectric actuators implemented to vibrate the bristles.
The same principle applies to transducers generating ultrasounds in medical imaging. When a voltage is applied to a crystal, the molecules rotate and the crystal is deformed, producing high-frequency vibrations. Having spoken of all those fascinating features, it may be suspicious to you that I still haven't explained why my fingers shamefully aren't piezoelectric. This is because they don't meet two crucial requirements that you may have spotted while gossiping about quartz structure. Firstly, there are few polar bonds in my skin. This prevents charge from being asymmetrically shifted upon squeezing. Keratin, though, being the building block of the outer layers of my skin, is in fact piezoelectric. The effect is just way smaller because it is built up of different elements than quartz. Secondly, symmetry is an issue. Quite fortunately, keratin doesn't have the point symmetry that prevents piezoelectricity. If it did, the comfort zone would have been non-existent. Look, if I rotate the setting now, nothing changes. So, where is the problem, you might ask? The helical chains of keratin are mixed like spaghetti. There is way less arrangement-related order. But it doesn't mean that polymeric substances can't be piezoelectric. Just some further restrictions apply. These two requirements are of crucial importance. They limit the number of materials whose properties may include piezoelectricity. There are 74 substances used industrially, but extensive research is being undertaken in this field, and only in 2020, 8,000 papers were published on piezoelectricity. So once again, what's the importance of these numbers? They show the consequences of the selection rules that we worked out. The bad news is that these rules are destructive. They can tell what is not piezoelectric. But as the example of my fingers shows, it's not a recipe. But there is one very good news. Who wants to do some freaking piezoelectric at home? Mix some soda ash and cream of tartar. As always, add a bit of love. Then cool it and you can grow your shell salt. You can even plug it to a V-meter and see how the voltage changes when you top it. This crystal was one of the very first piezoelectric materials to have been discovered. Making use of this bug, let's finish off with two lessons on scientific progress learned during the research on piezoelectric materials. There are profound parallels between it and the current pandemic. One. Wars, pandemics, and all other sorts of just run away catastrophes may be the only way to accelerate your research, even if it's groundbreaking. By researching quartz, the Curie brothers had inferred one of the most basic laws of physics, which was later called the Noether theorem. However, had Titanic not sank and had the need for sonars not been at hand, the world probably wouldn't have heard about these materials for a lot longer. Likewise, many epidemiologists would have not been appreciated had the COVID-19 pandemic not happened. Two, even if a wider audience does hear about your research, a sheer amount of luck and good patenting law is needed. The development of piezoelectric devices in the USA in the 1950s was kept within the companies doing the research, mostly due to the wartime beginnings of the field, which suppressed the market. By contrast, Japanese manufacturers shared their information, readily overcoming technical difficulties and creating new markets. For example, lead zirconate titanate binary systems were protected by Cleveland's US patent. The Japanese manufacturers thus investigated intensively the fernery systems. They turned out to have more design flexibility, performing better than the binary systems. Cleveland's and other US companies did not approach the situation resiliently enough. 
That may be a reason why scientists from across the world signed a statement on collaboration on COVID-19 vaccine development. This includes people from the University of Oxford, to whom we owe one of the vaccines. Thus remember, even scientists researching resilience struggle with being resilient. But so far, everyone who has bet against science lost his money because of the very resilience of the inventors. That's how science works, how it brings about revolutions, how it goes through every challenge a bit stronger and a bit better. And even the slightest physical effect imaginable should motivate you to stay resilient. Science is not a magical trick. Stay piezoelectric.